In this video, we're going to spend some time talking about continuation bedding factors because whenever we're looking to potentially continuation bed or not, we need to take a variety of factors into consideration because they all play a role in determining whether we should see bed or not. So what I have here listed on the screen are some of the important factors I think you need to consider before you determine whether you should see bed or not. And I had thought about creating a PowerPoint lecture with several different slides with tons of bullet points, but I ended up deciding not to do that and just using this graphic here as a way to help me explain. So let's go ahead and let's get started. So let's start at the top. The first thing that I want to talk about is board texture. So board texture, it's something that I've talked about in the post flop fundamentals course and a lot of my other courses. So what role does that play in whether we should see bet or not? Well, if you think about our basic see betting strategy, we see bet our good drawing hands as a semi bluff. We see bet our strong value hands for value. We check back our medium strength hands as bluff catchers, and we check back our weakest hands. Now, if we apply those to wet or dry board textures, that's going to help us to determine what type of a hand that we have. So of course, in a wet board texture, it's going to be draw heavy. So that gives us the ability to semi bluff with the drawing hands. And we're also value betting with our strongest hands and also value betting for protection. Now on dry board texture, we are value betting our strongest hands and we don't really have any drawing hands on really dry board textures. So we can ignore those and then our medium strength hands or weakest hands, well, those are going to be our checking hands. We're going to be check folding our weakest hands. We're going to be check calling our medium strength hands, which are our bluff catchers. So that's the importance of board texture. Now, the second thing that I want to talk about is relative hand strength. So in regards to relative hand strength or hand strength in general, again, something that I talk about in the post flop fundamentals course. So we have absolute hand strength and we have relative hand strength. So when you think about absolute hand strength, think about a bad recreational player. They're going to look at their two whole cards. They're going to look at the board. They're going to say, oh, I have a pair of kings, or I have a pair of aces, or I have a flush draw, or I have nothing. That's absolute hand strength. They don't consider their opponents and their opponent's ranges and how those connect with the board. Relative hand strength determines the strength of your hand relative to your opponent's ranges of cards and how those connect with the board. So understanding your opponents, understanding their ranges, understanding how they play, understanding how their range connects with the board allows you to better determine the strength of your hand, whether you have a strong value hand, a medium strength value hand, a weak hand, or a drawing hand. So that's the importance of relative hand strength. It allows you to understand the strength of your hand. The next one that I want to talk about in here is number of opponents. And this plays a role for a couple of reasons. Number one, it plays a role in the equity of our hand and whether we can value it or not. It actually goes hand in hand with relative hand strength. And it also plays a role in regards to something called combined fold probability to determine whether we can bluff or not. So to help us understand this, I'm going to go ahead and pull in Equilab. And let me go ahead and clear this out. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the concept of diminished equity, which is something that I coined in my book, Master Micro Six Poker. And what it states essentially is that the more people that there are in the hand, the lower our equity is in the hand, meaning the lower the probability of us winning is because each player that enters that hand, they each have their equitable fair share portion of that hand. So let's actually take a look at this. So let's say that we are MP2. Let's give ourselves a 6% range, a fairly tight range. And let's go ahead and let's say we have one opponent that we're playing against. They have a 15% range. Against this single opponent, we're close to a 60% equity favorite. Well, what happens if we add in a second opponent, and let's say that they're calling with a 20% range. Take a look at our equity and our opponent's equity. They both go down. 
So you'll notice that our equity decreases down to 43%. Our initial opponent's equity decreases to 30%, and the third opponent that came in with a 20% range, they now have 27% equity. Now let's say we add in another opponent, let's give them a 14% range. Again, I'm just randomly picking some ranges. You'll notice again, everybody's equity goes down. Let's add in small blind, let's give them a 25% range just for the heck of it. And our equity declines a bit more as does everybody else's. And let's go ahead and give Big Blind a 15% range as well. And you're gonna notice our equity continues to decline. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that as more people enter the pot, our equity declines. And not just ours, everybody in the hand, because every single person in this hand, they have their equitable fair share portion of that pot mathematically and statistically. So for that reason, the relative hand strength of our hand needs to be a lot stronger when we're playing against multiple opponents versus when we're playing heads up. And that's the whole point. The more people there are in the hand, the lower equity, and the stronger of a hand we need to value it because relative hand strength plays an important role in that. So that's the point in value betting. Now let's talk about the point it plays and bluffing and semi-bluffing. So now there's a concept of something called combined fold probability. So what does that mean? What am I talking about here? Well, with combined fold probability, and I went ahead and put this together and I actually want to expand this a little bit. And let me actually do a couple of things in here real quick. So combined fold probability, it's a probability that everybody that you're playing against folds combined, meaning they all fold the hand. And this plays a role in pure bluffing and semi-bluffing. So when we're talking about bluffing as a pure bluff, it relies on fold equity, the probability that our opponent is going to fold. A semi-bluff relies on fold equity combined with our draw in hand equity, the likelihood that our draw is going to complete. Whenever we're bluffing, we want to look at fold probability combined with, if we're semi-bluffing, our draw in hand probability. Now in terms of that, what happens is that when we have more than one opponent, we have to consider the likelihood that they're both going to fold. And the way that it works is we multiply their probabilities together. So what I've done here is against one opponent, let's say this opponent folds 80% of the time. Well, we know that if we bet, they're going to fold to a C bet 80% of the time. Well, if we have two opponents here, Let's say we have one opponent that folds 80% of the time. We have a second one that folds 50% of the time. The probability of both of them folding combined is only 40%. Now, what happens if we add in three opponents? Well, let's say we have one opponent that folds 75% of the time, one that folds 60% of the time, and one that folds 45% of the time. Combined, all three of them are only going to fold 20% of the time. So what does this tell us? It means that as we're facing more opponents, our fold equity declines. So we should be bluffing much less often versus most multiple opponents, whereas if we're only facing one or two opponents, we can bluff more often. Ideally, we want to bluff more often versus a single opponent. And then once we get to two and three or more, we wanna bluff much less. And then the same thing goes for Valiant, right? Versus a heads up opponent, the value hand can be a lot weaker, so we can value a bit more often, but against more opponents, the portion of our range that we can actually value bet for value and get worse hands to call declines. So the relative hand strength has to go up as well. So that's the importance of the number of opponents. Very important. And I think it's something that a lot of people really don't consider mathematically, but it plays a huge role. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Number four in here is position. So position is something that everybody should be aware of and something they should know. So in terms of position, we're either in position or we're out of position. And when we're in position, we get to see what our opponents do before us and we get to close the action in the hand as well. Because of that, we get to have more information than they do. And because poker is a game of incomplete information, the person that has the most information is 
more likely than not going to make the best decision. I say more likely than not because we all are on different skill levels. But what this tells us is that we tend to overrealize our equity when we're in position and we tend to underrealize our equity when we're out of position. And if we think about it from the perspective of the different positions at the table, well, the small blind is the least profitable. We actually expect to lose money in the small blind and the big blind, but the button is the most profitable decision or profitable position in No Limit Texas Hold'em because of the power of position and positional advantage. So what does this tell us? Well, we should be bluffing and we should be semi-bluffing more in position. Out of position, it's much harder to do that. So we should be bluffing and semi-bluffing a bit less. Um, it's gonna also going to be a lot harder to effectively value bet out of position versus in position as well. And that's another reason. So let's move on to the next one. Let's talk about equity. So equity goes hand in hand with relative hand strength as well as everything else that we've already talked about, but really our relative hand strength. So I want you to always consider the equity of hand of your hand before you bet. And if we think back to our general C betting strategy, there's a reason why we C bet our strong value hands and our drawing hands on a wet board texture, because they both have a lot of equity compared to our medium strength hands and our weakest hands. So equity plays an important role in our C betting strategy. We don't want to be C betting hands that have very low equity. We want to be C betting hands that have decent equity. Now again, of course, there are those exploitative adjustments that I talked about. So sometimes we're going to be thin value betting our medium strength hands. Sometimes we're going to be bluffing with hands that have no showdown value and so forth. But generally, the higher the equity, the more often we want to bet. The lower the equity, the more often we want to check. All right, moving on to the next item is the vulnerability of our hand. And this goes hand in hand with us talking about the idea of protection betting and the first lecture. So it also goes hand in hand with board texture. So on a wet board texture, our hand is gonna be a lot more vulnerable than if it's on a dry board texture. And because of the vulnerability of our hand, we're incentivized to value bet slash protection bet our hands that are vulnerable to a lot of bad turns and river cards on a wet board texture. Whereas on a dry board texture, our hand is either way ahead or way behind. And if we're way ahead, we can look to slow play our hand, look to allow our opponents to catch up and let them go ahead and induce them to bet or to allow them to call our C bets when our hand looks a lot weaker. So that's the vulnerability of our hand. Fairly straightforward. Barrel potential. This is a very important one. And this goes hand in hand with our drawing hands and specifically backdoor draws. So what is a backdoor draw? Well, it's nothing more than a runner runner draw that requires two cards to complete the draw. So on the flop, you may have a backdoor draw to a flush, meaning you need both the turn and the river card to make that flush. So when we're looking to semi-bluff a hand, one of the things that I like to look for is barrel potential. And so something that's going to improve my hand to another draw on the turn. So let's say that I have a straight draw plus a backdoor flush draw. Well, if I don't improve to my straight on the turn, but I pick up a card that gives me a flush draw, now I have a flush draw and a straight draw on the turn, and I can barrel Again, meaning fire out a second barrel, a second C-bet on the turn. So that's the importance of barrel potential. And I love barrel potential. I lo love looking at hands and looking at C-bet drawing hands that have barrel potential because it allows us to be very aggressive with our drawing hands and allows us to try to effectively utilize fold equity to its maximum. Because what you're going to find at the micro stakes is that a lot of people like to call one C bet, but when it comes to two C bets, a lot of them are going to have a tendency to fold. So that's the importance of barrel potential. Fairly straightforward. And as you play, you'll get a knack for identifying draws that have backdoor draws that give you barrel potential to barrel on the turn. <laughs> 
All right, so let's move to the next one. The next one is stack sizes. So stack sizes play a role as well in regards to whether we're going to determine whether we should continuation bet or not. And particularly, I want you to focus on short stack opponents because we're going to be playing 100 big blind stacks. That's what I preach and recommend to all my students is that you sit there with a 100 big blind stack. But at the micro stakes, you're going to have some opponents that are sitting there with a 20 big blind stack, a 30 big blind stack, a 40 big blind stack, stacks all over the place under 100 big blinds. And this is important to take into consideration. So you need to take the effective stack sizes into consideration because they really dictate how you should see bet primarily as a bluff and a semi-bluff. Specifically, if we're looking to either bluff or semi-bluff, we need to be cognizant of the likelihood of our opponent potentially re-raising us all in as a short stack. And so for that reason, when we are facing a short stacker, we're only going to want to be bluffing or semi-bluffing. And I'll just say semi-bluffing with hand with a very strong draw. We don't want to peer bluff because let's say we are playing heads up versus a 25 big blind short stacker. If we look to bluff the flop and he raises all in, then we have to fold and we dispute off some chips. If we're semi-bluffing, we want to semi-bluff with hands that can call a re-raise stack off from a short stacker. So I want you to understand that because that plays an important role with shorter stack sizes. And that's really the main point of stack sizes. We can talk about playing deep stacked, but it's really important with short stack play. In deep stack play, it's not really an issue. All right, so on to the last one our opponent's playing style and their tendencies. So if you're not utilizing a HUD, if you're not taking notes on your opponents, you should because you need to understand how your opponent plays. If you don't understand how they play, then you don't know how to adjust your game to exploit weaknesses in their game. So what you need to be doing and what you should be doing at the table is as you sit down, play att pay attention to everybody at the table, regardless of whether you're in a hand or not. Take notes on your opponents, look to supplement your head stats, anything out of the ordinary, anything that you can exploit. Um, whether your opponent is a good opponent or they're a bad opponent, start tagging them. Start utilizing this information, start compiling it. And what we can do, these standard lines that I've talked about, we can deviate from them to increase the profitability of our play. Now, this seabedding course, the seabedding 101 course, really isn't a course on exploitative play, but really you should be looking to deviate from the standard lines that we talk about. So, for example, if our opponent is folding to 80% of seabeds, for example, uh, we can seabet a very wide range profitably. If our opponent is folding to a lot of double barrels, but they're always calling a single barrel, well, then we should fire a double barrel. Things like that. These are exploitative adjustments. Or if our opponent is a calling station and we have a weaker made hand, well, we can then value bet that. So again, we should always be looking at our opponent's playing style tendencies before we look to see bet or to also look for ways to deviate from our standard lines. All right, so we covered everything. I know I covered a lot. I know this has been one of the lengthier videos, but I wanted to make sure that we talked about all of these different factors because they all play a role. So I hope that you found this interesting. I hope that you found it beneficial. If you did, I appreciate it. If you have any questions, always let me know. If not, thanks for watching, and I'll see you at the next video. Take care.